God bless you for your interest in the children's ministry. And I just want to uh, share a few words as we begin as words of encouragement uh, and, and giving you a bit of a, a goal as, as we're looking ahead. When you're involved in children's ministries, number one, it is a calling and it's a gifting and it's equip it is an equipping from the Lord as much as any other ministry in the church. You know, some people may look at it and say, oh, well, you really have to be skilled, for example, to be on the worship team or the worship leaders. But like I said, oh, anybody can do kids' ministries. That's not true. That's not true. The Bible is very clear that it fits the whole body together and it gives and equips everybody for certain ministries in the church. And so, as you've seen us at Lighthouse, we don't have necessarily all the huge equipment and all of the big, big resources that some other really big, fancy churches have. But what we, but what we have, God can use as we give it to Him in our hearts. And so that's one of the reasons we want to meet this afternoon. We want to get better equipped. We want to be better trained. And we want to open the door to others who are also interested in ministry and who also uh, want to be involved in children or youth ministry. Almost every single missionary that's in the Philippines right now that has come out of Lighthouse in fact, I would say every single one of them was involved in children's ministries in Lighthouse. That's where they got their start, uh, and in foundations classes as well. And so you, we, we look at it, we look, we get invested and involved in things like this. We think, well, this is what I'm doing. God's plan is always bigger than our plan, and God's purposes are always more long term than ours are. And you have no idea what God still has in store for you ahead. You, know, you may think, like, well, I'm just going to help with the preschoolers, you know, when I can, or whatever. But God always has a bigger plan. And so because of that, and not just because of that, but because of that, we do the work and we do the ministry with diligence, with prayer, with excellence, and we give it to the Lord, and then the Lord does the Lord with it. As we, as we give Him our best, He takes what is our best, multiplies it, and then He knows I can use them for more as well. So it's really exciting and I just want to encourage you this afternoon. If you're involved in children's ministries in Lighthouse or wherever, youth ministries in Lighthouse, you have a tremendous opportunity and privilege and responsibility to touch people for the Lord. Uh, Sister Bridget probably has the, uh, uh, probably has the, uh, uh, what's it called, the statistics. And I don't remember the exact statistics now, but if I remember correctly, it's something like this. Um, uh, Eighty percent, eighty percent of all Christians. I mean, it just it, this is a U.S. statistic. Eighty percent of all the Christians said they became Christians in Sunday school before the age of, I think, eleven or before the age of fourteen. It's something. It's something like that. I think that's the. Yeah, it's, that's the statistic. And so when you look at that, people coming to the Lord, you've got 100% of people, 80% of them were touched for God and lives changed for God at the very ages that you are reaching and teaching them. So it's a huge responsibility. It's a huge responsibility. I, I think about, she's not here this afternoon because she's not involved in the children's ministries, but Heidi, you know, Chinese Heidi. You know when she started? She came when we had like a, uh, sort of a VBS thing years ago when she was 14, young young teenager. I think she was 12 or 13 or something. And she came, and that's where she got started. She was not a Christian, did not know the Lord, is not from a Christian family. And look at her, and look at her now. So praise the Lord. You have a wonderful privilege and a wonderful responsibility. So don't look down on what you do. Don't belittle what you do. Don't feel like, well, anybody can do this. Um, and never look at it and say, well, it doesn't take a lot to take care of children. I can just put in this much. Always hold in high esteem and value greatly um, what you put in to preparation for the children in prayer and in practical things. And so that's one of the reasons we're having this meeting this afternoon and then in two weeks as well. And the, the enemy will always try to get you to feel like, it's unimportant. It doesn't really matter. You can just wing it. You know that expression? To wing it? In other words, you don't have to really prepare. Just glance over the lesson. They're just kids. You know, you can do anything and entertain them. 
And the enemy will always push you to that, especially when you get busy. Never let him push you to that. Invest in the children and you will reap eternal rewards in their lives. I'm going to turn it over now to Bridget and to Melrose. All I'm going to say, uh, all I want to do is, th is to say is this. Please take this with you. Read through it. Read over it. Some of you at the end of it may decide, maybe Children's Ministries is not for me. And others of you will say, yes, Lord, you have called me to this. And so um, take it, read over it, and pray over it for the next two weeks. On the last page, as you will see, there is a covenant commitment. And you've done something like this before. If you've, been, if you've signed this before, this one's a little bit different. And this is one that on, that on that following Sunday or when you reach the point where you say, Yes, Lord, in these two weeks, when you come to this point where you say, Yes, Lord, I commit and I covenant with you and with the church to minister in this area. You'll sign that. That's between you and God. And then two weeks from this Sunday, we will give you another sheet that is this sheet. And before God and before the pastors and in the presence of the church and as witnesses, those of you who say, yes, this is, I'm making this co covenant commitment, will sign again. And, um, uh, and then we'll keep that copy so we'll have, we'll have a record of it and you'll, have, and you'll keep this as well. So please keep this with you in two weeks bring it back okay and we'll talk about it there are details in here but I don't want to take time with that today because these lovely ladies have all sorts of things prepared for us this afternoon so good afternoon um, there are a lot of questions that you know Pastor Jennifer has um, mentioned like um, why are the, I mean not question but t she said that being a Sunday school teacher is important it's a calling, it's a gifting, it's um, our responsibility for the children um, because we have the opportunity to change their lives. But what is being a Sunday school teacher? There's a lot of people, um, we are not trained, I am not a teacher, and this is not my profession, but because it's a calling, it's God who equips, it's God who gives um, wisdom. So um, what I'm gonna tell you is maybe something that you have already know, but it's to reiterate how important um, Sunday school, being a Sunday school teacher is. So, next slide, Bob. If you cannot see, it says here that only one of these is not in the Bible. <laughs> so, what does he mean? <laughs> this is your homework. See, that's why. Second slide. Second slide, Bob. <laughs> that's why our first responsibility as a Sunday school teacher is to know our Bible. It's very basic. It is. You may say that, nah, you know, um, I go to church, I attend um, the service, but it's more of like we ourselves have to know the Bible because we are teaching them. We cannot teach something that we don't even know. And we have like what um, Sister Isaac, what's her name? Yvette. Yvette. She said that um, God has a purpose and we have to look at it not on like oh they are with me right now and next year maybe they're gonna be on another teachers uh, responsibility no we have to look at it as um, an opportunity that we could be impacting their lives that 
after 30 years, what would they become? Will they still remember what I've taught? Would they, um, would my teaching have an impact on their lives? Because it is important. That's why we have to know the love of our, second slide, Paul. Yes, know your Bible. So first is, uh, we have to know the Father's love because it's not only us teaching the children the basics about the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, all the books, and you recite, you know, verses, but it's also, th th these children, they look at us. They see how we love them. They see our action. It's very, um, we are like in front, like the pastors for the children. And um, that's why we have to know. How do we know is first, we have to reflect on God's love. We have to know what is God's purposes for them. We have to know what God says about the children. God said that, it says in the Bible that children are a gift from God. Children, um, let the children come to me. So you see how important the children are for God. And this is um, very important. So I, I will just reiterate that it's our role is not like what Pastor Jennifer said that um, it's not only singing, it's not only um, saying uh, Bible verses or stories, but it's impacting their lives. So we ourselves have to be impacted by the Word of God. We have to pray, we have to meditate, and before they could, their lives could be transformed, our lives have to be transformed first. That is the first thing, because we cannot teach something that we do not know. We cannot teach something that we do not take in. So that's uh, one thing and another is when we uh, read the Word of God um, we know God's purposes for them we look at it in a bird's eye view we look at it as seeds being planted in their lives we may not see the change now we may not see how our actions how the Bible teachings that we do um, affect them but what we need to know is the bird's eye view that um, that these are seeds that we are planting and when we plant seeds we also pray for them so that's going to be my second but not yet Pastor Renee uh, so um, like what uh, it seems like what Sister Yvette has mentioned a while ago is a really tie up with what we are doing right now. We are being trained. We are looking at God's purposes for these children. And we are part of the purposes, God's purposes for these children. And we have to know that I heard someone say that oh, all these children, they know the Bible already and it's like I have no impact. I, I, when I tell them, they know already and it's more of like, right? So, and, and for them, they feel like you feel defeated. You feel like, how can I do this and how can I uh, make my, make the story more uh, interesting Thank you. so what we need to know is and be reminded of is the Bible is the inspired Word of God and it it's God's breath and it has power maybe now we don't see but we pray we hope and we continue to strive to um, teach the children so the next one is how can we do that? Ta -da! I should have more things, but I just ran out of you know uh, time. That's why I put you know 
the faces of our children here. We have to know our children. We have to know the students. You may say that, oh, after two, week, two years, they will be on different class, or I'm not sure if I'll still be here. But when we know our students, we would be able to know how to teach them. It's like friends. You would know how to um, talk to someone if you know the background, if you know um, the things that make this person interested. So it's the same thing with the children. We don't only come and say like, uh, like me, I forget my niece's name. I would call all their names except for that person's name. But it's not with the name, it's what, it's me knowing what they want and who they are. And that is our role. It's not only a monthly cycle. We have to know them to be able to teach them. And Sister Bridget is going to um, tell us the, about the learning cycle because each group have capabilities and abilities to grasp um, the things that we are telling. But like, how can we determine it? So she will um, say more on that one. Another is, um, like what I told you, we have to know their background. Some of the children, they don't respond to shouting because they've been shouted at with at home many times. So it's like, <laughs> am I right? Yes. And it's more of like, and I'll, I'll tell you personal, not me. <laughs> it's my sister. I'm so happy she's not here. But anyways, <laughs> no, my sister would say like, not, 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 not. And it's like, come on, she, he will not respond. But with me, because I know him, so I would just call him once. And if he doesn't, the second time, I will go and pick him up. So it's more of like, when we know, they would, we would be able to understand and be able to apply the right pressure, the right teaching to them. So another uh, thing that we have to know about our students are their uh, family background. Some of them, we feel that they are they don't trust people so much, and they are so quiet. There is always a reason. Um, sometimes we cannot just ask them like, oh, are your parents quarreling or this? But you would be able to know that with the children when they tell you things, because the children, they will tell things. And no, <laughs> no breaks. So it's more of like when you are, when you know them, you put them in their heart, in your heart, and pray for them. Um, yeah, and you know, some of the, not a lot of our children here have broken families, but there are some that are. So how can we show love? It's by knowing who they are and their background. So, um, yeah, so when we know them, we would be able to be balanced on our discipline, on how we teach, and how we catch their attention. Um, another is we have to know their abilities. Some of the children, they are slower. Some of them are younger, so they could not grasp as fast as the others. Some of them have grown to a Christian family, so they know all the Bible stories. And this person is very new and it's more of like just looking at you and just and you don't know what they are thinking so make sure that you get to know them because I know that when we it's it's the same with us when we feel that we are um, that people listen to us that people care about us we are more op open to them and we trust them more. So it's the same thing with the children. Uh, the next one is, 
this is more of the technical. This is something that we will grow, like what Pastor Jennifer said. Um, we would have more trainings because I know that all of us are not teacher by profession. But yeah, so I'll just here. Um, but like what she said, that this is a calling. And when we ask God, like, Lord, I wanted to teach, but I don't know. God is always good. It's um, one thing that I always remember and put in my heart. If there's anything that is um, that I don't know, I would, I would um, remember the verse that God is a good father and he will not withheld anything or yeah he will not without anything that is good he will not give um, if we ask for bread he will not give us stones so if we he knows and we know that this is for the ministry God will not say nah that is not your gifting you know find something else ask for something else no this is one thing that I've proven in my life and many times I've been put in a position that I know nothing, like the medical mission, Pastor in Ages. I offered because I speak Tagalog, and then he just threw me out in the open and I almost drowned. But I've learned <laughs> but I've learned from it. I've learned that Lord okay I don't know this I am not an organized person I really am not but because um, God knows my heart and I want to serve him and it's for his purpose he gives and it says also in the Bible that if you lack wisdom you ask so if you think that you don't have the skills God knows if this is for the children, would he withheld it from you? No. He will give it to you without. What is that? A uh, fault or something. Anyways, you know that verse. Um, so, um, So those are the responsibilities as a, like, I think that are important for to have to be a Sunday school um, teacher. One thing about knowing your subject, like what I told you, like, um, we should not be complacent and we should not be happy with where we are. We have to increase in knowledge so that means that we have to learn and to be trained we ourselves have like you all have Android or iPhone or whatever don't use it for Facebook don't use it for verses that use it for your class find the words find crafts find um, interesting stories that you could tell your children children and that is using what the technology to increase your knowledge. And we have a lot of books. Please use them because that's why we invested on books. We invested on those things so that we could be equipped. We should not be just happy on, okay, this Sunday and what does David Cook say? Okay, that's it. We have to sharpen our sword. <laughs> we have to find ways. If we could not find it on the internet, ask people, talk to them, and ask the pastors. Um, there are, uh, on the next week, we are going to give um, strategies, some strategies on how to teach children and um, some ways how to teach them. Another is um, not only knowing your subject, but also knowing how to ask. 
sometimes we just ask a yes and no uh, question and we are disappointed because we receive the yes and no answer and sometimes like why are they not do they not get it and for us we need some more but the thing is the question is wrong you just ask for a yes and no question so what you ask that's what they give so we have to learn to elaborate, elaborate and stimulate their minds and ask you know learn to ask so these are yes so the next part would be um, we would be tackling oh, the um, uh, learning cycle we're using David C. Cook uh, Ministries uh, material we've been using this material for many years about 18 years I would say 20 years and what I like of that material is it's easy to teach it's uh, easy to follow uh, but but they have reasons why they, they put it like this and I'm going to try to elaborate a little bit and maybe take time to focus some question and answer if there are things you don't understand you would like to clarify my first uh, part is a, a short very short video it's called the paradigm shift in Christian education and it's in the world too is the way the teaching is done nowadays that I don't know about the Chinese schools uh, here in Hong Kong but I know the international schools have a very different approach and it used to be in the past and in in the West also so I will just let the video talk and then we can elaborate that a paradigm is the framework in which we usually think. Paradigms used to stay the same for a long time, but now with rapidly changing technology, paradigms are changing more quickly too. Paradigms are changing in Christian education. When I grew up, education was teacher-centered. The teacher was in control of everything and did most of the talking in class. Today, Education is more student-centered, geared for more student participation. The students now have more input in the class. In the past, Bible knowledge was king. If you knew all the Bible facts, the books of the Bible, all the apostles, the Ten Commandments, you were the star of the class. Now, life skills are important. The people you are trying to reach don't care what you know. They're more interested in what your Bible knowledge has done for you. Will it do the same for them? If they don't see life changes in you, they won't respond to Bible facts. Uniformity was the norm in Christian education. In adult classes, everyone could be studying from the same Bible quarterly across the country, reading the same verses and answering the same questions. But now, students want options and flexibility. They want it customized so it will work for them, for the subjects they want to study. Finally, education used to be top-down. The older we were, the more information we had to pass down to someone younger. But sometime when computers came along, it turned bottom-up. The children were getting information more quickly and were teaching the adults. They were teaching us how to program VCRs, to operate computers, or anything with advanced technology. These are just some of the changes in education that will influence the way we teach in Christian education. Who can tell me what you understood from that short video? some ideas what did you get from it what was it like before and still in certain country about the teacher being centered at the beginning and having the control but nowadays more so the students being more having more input in the class yes 
it's more and more like this. The teacher will always be the teacher. You always have more information, that's for sure. Like what Melrose just told us, you, have, you know more than them. So you can establish the lines. But it used to be that you, the, the, the children, even me, I'm not, I'm not young, so you just sat down and shh, took notes until, you know, I have, I have a crooked finger because I have taken so many notes in my youth. But now it's very different. The children, they do lots of research, they find out for themselves, and they say if they find out, then they will remember it. Of course, you always establish the lines, but it, if you are teaching with what the material we have, they always say, uh, they always give options for the children to talk, right? Yes, yes. Uh, and answer questions like what Melrose says, answer the right kind of question. So you make them think. And just before we go further, when you ask a question, don't always go and give the answer if there is no answer within 30 seconds. Give time. Let, let the children think and you will see it will come and they will eventually answer. Uh, another thing it said was, uh, yeah, knowledge. We don't want to give them knowledge. So if they get, say, Oh, I know that story, like what Melrose was mentioning. But what we want to do is not tell them stories. What do, you, what do we want to do is, how does it apply to my life, the life skills? Yeah, okay. So every time I come to my students and, uh, and introduce a subject, I tell them, you already know that, the story. You already know. but. Today we're looking at these verses for a very specific purpose. You, you tell them so your um, smart minds will say, okay. They won't say, I know, I know. Okay, now we will go to another step. It's called the natural life uh, learning cycle. The natural learning cycle. You've seen in the David C. Cook uh, books, step one, step two, step three, step four. Those who've been here for a long time, uh, we've, we've had a training for, uh, about that long time ago. But uh, the way I look at all of you, I don't think many of you, maybe Mercy, maybe Rose, maybe Sister Gurley, but maybe Sister Kay but, and Francia, but not many of you, you were here, so I thought it would be good to look at it again. So before I say more, let's watch the video. Students come in all varieties. Some are talkers. Some like to ask lots of questions. Some are very quiet and still, while others are in constant motion. We never know which students will show up in our classrooms each week, but we can be prepared for any and all of them by following the steps of the natural learning cycle to reach everyone we teach. The purpose of step one is to link your students' life experiences to the lesson focus and interest them in the topic. This is the step that tells them why they need to know this information. In this step, the teacher's role is that of a motivator to get them to talk, to share their experiences with the rest of the class. This is the attention-getting step. Students come to class with a hole in their soul, a Bible-shaped hole that they need filled that day, a connection to their own lives. When you skip step one and go right into the Bible lesson, you fail to hook them. Step one is designed to let the students know that you're aware of problems they may face, but you have an answer for them. Step one pulls them into the lesson. Don't leave that step out. The purpose of step two is to present the Bible information to your students. This is the step that asks, what do I need to know? 
In this step, the teacher is the information giver to make sure they know what the Bible says. In step two, we study the word. Step one says to the student that you realize they have a need and you have an answer for it. Step two encourages the student to get into God's word and see what it has to say about the need. We connect the need to God's word. If the students realize they have a need, they're more open to the word. The purpose of step three is to provide a variety of opportunities to practice information the students have just acquired. This step asks the question, how does this information work? In this step, the teacher is a coach. Help them practice, practice, practice. The goal of this step is to try it out, to practice. Step three says, I am going to try to take the word and put it into my life. It's not just about learning facts. I need to put them in my life and make a difference. This is where we see if the information will work for us. An example would be Jesus serving people. The application would be that I need to serve people too. So in class, students practice serving each other. The beauty of this step is the safe, controlled environment where every child succeeds in trying out what God's Word says. You, as the teacher, help make it work. The purpose of Step 4 is to encourage your students to apply what they've learned to their everyday experiences. This step asks, what can I do with this? In this step, the teacher is an encourager. Help them to have a plan and evaluate their plan. This step encourages students to live out what they've learned. You don't want the lesson to end in the classroom. You want your students to go out and let the world know something about what they've studied. For example, they practiced how to be a servant in step three. Now they need to figure out a way to be a servant at home. The activity may be for each student to write a list of things they will do at home to show how they want to be servants like Jesus. It's not enough just to know the facts. They need to do something with them. You need to encourage them to take the Bible lesson out into the world. Try to structure your lesson so that you include each step of the learning cycle. Grab their attention and pull them into the lesson. Get them into the Word. Help them feel comfortable with the concept. Then send them out into the world to make a difference. It's very straightforward. I don't think I have much to add. Um, Maybe a review. So, step one, what are you? Motivator. Did you take notes? Ah, very good. Or you have a very good memory. And what does the motivator do? Catch their attention. That's why in, in the step one, you don't talk about the Bible. Just talk about stuff. It can be, it can be a video, uh, or a picture, or a story, or a discussion, a game, anything. Don't try to go fast on that one. I've done the mistake of making my step one so well that I didn't have much time to do the rest. <laughs> so try to be fast. Uh, what's the second step? After they are motivated, we talk about this and like she said, serving people, why should we do that? Anyway, so what's the, the step two? Information. The purpose of Information giver. So this is when you go to the Bible. Of course, if they are too young, you 
tell them the story or you tell them the verses if they are older they can read it in turn or in group depending on their ability and then after that you can always review if they, if they know you can ask question step three what is it and what is it for what do they do uh, okay, I need a, a hand up and one person talking because I can't hear everybody at the same time. Step three. Many people answer, yeah? Yes, how do you practice it? How do you live it out? So you practice in, it's called, she said, practice, practice, practice. So you have a choice. You always have a choice of three activity we'll talk about it next time more in depth so you can cho choose one or you can make two and they choose or whatever we'll talk more about it later and the last one what are you encourager, encourager. what do we encourage them to do okay Encourage them to do what? Yeah, to practice when they go home, when they are in school. They, they, they make a plan how to live it out. Now, I know we have a time constraint, a lot of time. We're squished in our time and we cannot elaborate very much. So if we don't have much time, maybe you will have to to go a bit faster on the motivating on the step one, but make sure you start with something just, just to start talking about something. Maybe some will come and say, no, I don't feel like being here. I'm tired or this or that. My friend don't go to Sunday school. Maybe in the older kids. But if you start talking about their everyday life, just something, whatever they suggest is suggested. And if you have other things in mind, just to make them start thinking, why, why are, am I here today then? Then you can go to the second one, learning the fact. And the, the third one, because of time, often we only have time to do one. Uh, don't always do the easy one, don't always do the craft, or don't always do the same thing. We'll talk about it next time. Make some variety. And the application, Often, because of time, it won't go further than we pray together or we talk. But if you have time, they, there is always a project. There are full, this is full of projects in that material. Take time to read it. Uh, we'll talk more about it, how to prepare. But personally, it's very seldom that I read it. Uh, less than three times. When, I, when I'm going to teach, I go through it once, and then a second time, and then after that I can take notes. Sometimes only twice, but make sure you know. You need to know what you're talking about. Come prepared. All right. If you want any uh, handouts for that, uh, you, eventually we will prepare a booklet and put it all together. The last part today, I want you to bear with me. It's a, it's a PowerPoint. I put a whole document on PowerPoint. But don't worry, I'm not going to read everything that is there. I will try to be uh, in synchronization with my husband to change, the, to change uh, each slide quickly. It's ability, it's called abilities by age. Uh, you will notice as I will read them that the little people and the middle people and the big people, you don't do the same thing with them. Uh, unfortunately, many places where they are not very experienced, they put them all together in the same class. By God's grace, if they don't have any more teachers, and by God's grace, I, 
I hope that the little one will grasp something and the older one won't be too bored. But we have adopted the habit here in, in Lighthouse to separate groups. And what it does is that sometimes we only have two, three, or four per groups. And so that means, see, oh, how many people, we have more people teaching than we have children. This is a good thing because we want to make sure they learn according to their ability. And David Seacook is really well done for that. Now, what I will s follow here as the, the child ability doesn't follow really the David Seacook uh, pattern they have. They have toddlers, preschoolers, then early elementary, elementary, upper elementary, and then they have middlers, and then they have high schoolers. We will look at that more in depth next time. So what I will try to do is not bore you too much and go through that. Okay, let's start. Children birth to age to, to, age two, to two years old. Uh, it's a time when they, they, they rapidly change. Uh, they learn about themselves, it's, they are very self-centered. Move around, follow simple command, learning to trust. In the classroom, okay, I'm telling you this, we don't have yet a real class, but we have order material for the little ones. So in September, we will start with some material and eventually I will have to, ha I would like to have a training for those who would like to be involved with the little ones. It's, it's a different kind of approach. Okay, so create a positive atmosphere, atmosphere, sing, clap hands, repeat. You know how it is with little children. What they need is really your love, your presence, and you hold them, or you play with them. Spiritual messages they need to hear, that God loves them, and that we love them, and God loves mommy, and God loves them. It's very simple. Okay. The second age group would be two to three years old. So at that age, they... They are not, well, the thing is, at that age, they change very rapidly. So there are things that they have not yet developed. They are still exploring and learning about what's around them. Uh, they are beginning to develop their large motor skill, like to uh, walking, uh, jumping, running, climbing. They are developing their talking. Uh, they are learning about shapes and they, they like to play uh, in a room with other kids. They like blocks and all that. So it's, you can do little activities for a very short time. That's why the material we have ordered, it's like one minute thing for that, for that uh, lesson and one more minute again later and one more minute and we'll talk more about it. The spiritual messages is about the same. God loves them, their family, God made everything, Je Jesus loves you, we can pray. You can introduce prayer to them. God is good, God is trustful, truthful, caring. Okay. Um, age two to three. Now they learn more to relate with people. When they are little, they don't relate much with other people. Everything is very self-centered. But at that age, they start relating to their family. Also, they begin to be separated for their, from their family a little bit. They start going to kindy. You will see a big change in the classroom. Some of them whom who could never stay there without mom because they would cry, cry, cry. When they reach that age, they can go, mom can go sit down and, yeah. Because they start going to kindergarten. They learn to tell story, very short. Uh, they learn a few numbers, alphabet. 
They are learning to perfect their large motor skill, again, jumping, running, walking, dancing. Uh, they are beginning to develop their fine motor skills. Uh, they can clap hands, pick up jack, writing, not too much, but maybe a little bit. A uh, song with hands in motion. Um, children this age group enjoy these type of play like imagining, playing in groups of three, games uh, that for a short time, sounds, texture, color, smell, taste, everything that is uh, appealing to their sense, colors and music and all that. They like to hear Bible stories. They are able to listen about three to four, but it, it needs to be short. Um, their, their thinking is very concrete. Don't bring them the Trinity at that age. <laughs> they won't understand what it, what it is. Um, spiritual messages they need to hear. God the same. God cares about the family, made everything, he loves you, he made you. It's still very simple at that age and you will see with the program you have it's very basic. God hear our prayers. See they can pray. God is dependable, always good, trustworthy. And they are learning that there is a difference between right and wrong at that age of beginning. Age four to seven, now they are learning to relate to God more at that age. Maybe they start having a conscience a little bit more of right and wrong. They start to relate to family members and other people. They know more about the world. Uh, in school, they will have little project about their neighborhood, maybe their neighbors, their friends. Uh, they learn they are more learning to separate from the family members for a longer period of time. Uh, they learn new skills. They, lear they are learning to read, but they are not fluent. So you still have to read to them at that, at that time. They are learning to write their name, a few letters, and all that. They are learning numbers also in arithmetic. They are really in the and the uh, foundation of their learning of letters and, and, and numbers. Okay, can go to the next one. Okay, I skipped something. Okay, uh, they are perfecting their large motor skills even more. Now they are able to do sports they are beginning to do sports, like it says, kicking a ball, throwing a ball. They are getting better at that. Batting a ball. They are beginning to do more sports. They are perfect, perfecting their fine motor skills. Also, coloring is nicer. Uh, they don't just, you know, scribble. They are beginning to be better. They can draw a little bit, a little bit like big heads with big eyes, maybe less, maybe it's more about a more complete body. Um, they can do finger painting, they can create object with Play-Doh, singing, you can sing more elaborate songs. Uh, children this age enjoy imagining, um, Discovering, painting, playing music, singing, dancing, uh, acting out. This is something you can start doing for a story review. Start acting out the, st the story. Okay, you will be David, you will be Goliath. You know, they can start that at this age. Spiritual messages they need to hear. There is all the same list I said before. Plus, now there is a difference, they, they, they make more difference between right and wrong. Uh, they learn more that God has been involved through history, God has a plan for the future, Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus loves you. Sometimes we sin, 
So this is an introduction. At that age, they, you can introduce the concept of sin against God. Here it says, reassure the child that we all make mistakes. So a mistake is not a sin. So they need, you need to teach them what really a sin is. Jesus came to pay for their sin. And because Jesus... Because of what Jesus did, we can live forever. We can accept Jesus as a savior. So at that age, starting at four and up, you can introduce salvation. They, they can hear the and understand the Bible story. At that age, they are be able to understand now. And they are beginning to understand a little bit of abstract here it says like self-sacrifice or love for others they are beginning to be more open relating to other people faith doubt sin guilt and forgiveness and they learn to pray together children age 8 to 10 goal for this age um, I've been working with children of that age for many years so I can say that everything here is, especially here, accepting self. It's, they come to a certain age that they become more self-conscious of their strength and weaknesses, what they can do, what they cannot do. So they, they come to that age, they need to begin to learn to accept themselves about their strength and gift making friends, learning to get along with others, understand that we're all different and accepting differences, uh, their role in the society, responsibilities. Uh, at that age, here it says early readers, but I would say that they have at most of them have a reach at a stage of reading that it's more it's not only for information but it can be for fun but they are able to read and get some information from what they read they can read their bible they can write a new classroom they can write uh, some answers um, they also they can do certain types of chores at home and in the classroom try to involve them to help you uh, at least at the end put away the crayons put away things or give out the books whatever um, fine motor skills they are becoming very good most of them they are good with scissors and glue you will probably realize those who teach that age that they are not all good at art though uh, especially the boys I don't know and the writing uh, I've been involved a lot and I don't want to put down the boys it's just that that's the way they grow up girls uh, perfect their fine motor skill younger age than the boys so if the boys don't do as such a great job than the girls please don't compare them with the girls because it's going to come eventually it's just a different the boys will perfect maybe more the the what they call the gross motor skills the running and sports and all that and it come down to fine motor skill later they can do puzzle mad game at that age you can challenge them more with, with their brain Memorize the book of the Bible, verses, uh, pray together. Um, spiritual messages they need to hear, salvation. Salvation should be talked about almost every week, even if you don't teach about it. You can mention salvation. If you have, if you have believed in Jesus with all your heart, and if you are saved, then blah 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 or bring the salvation or at the end uh, if you're not saved maybe we can pray that you know bring salvation often I don't know if you remember um, Rena Lynn teaching us about that a few times that uh, she she said she taught the children and they prayed for salvation and she said twice 
in the following week some children had accident and died of course here in Hong Kong maybe there is more protection and more overseeing but you know talk about salvation a lot they can accept Jesus Jesus loved them has a wonderful plan they can trust God uh, Jesus is all powerful all knowing always present there's nothing you can do to make God loves you more or less uh, Jesus is the way we're saved by grace not by works and we they can start telling others about Jesus at that age and the last group for the children is the 10 to 12 at that age they are quite knowledgeable again it's important that they accept themselves that they learn more about their strength and give making friends uh, also here it says learning techniques to resolve conflict and to handle own emotion and this is something they need to to develop uh, understanding that we're all different and we need to accept people who think differently if someone thinks differently you, he's not your enemy he's just different um, the pro they are proficient readers uh, they read for self-enjoyment and relaxation you know about that have you ever watched Joshua and David Ibombo <laughs> They really read for self-enjoyment uh, and also they can read for information so they can read the Bible you can make them read you can make them try to explain what they have read um, they can find answers to the questions uh, what they like to do more complex game uh, more complex artwork um, uh, encourage participation in group chores in the classroom cleaning and all that uh, practice service to others this is something that as a church we've never really done uh, not much anyway because our children we're not like a small community and everybody lives near and we can reach out we're all from different part of Hong Kong so it's kind of hard to have them all here and go out for a project but this is something we could do sometimes every now and then have them involved in a project to help elderly or needy people uh, they can work with younger children um, I know in my school the year five they have they call it the year one buddy and every now and then they go get their year one buddy and they sit together they read them a story they can we could involve them every now and then to to be matched with the little ones um, they can pray together we can have Bible drill um, encourage treating others kindly speaking the truth with love uh, encourage spiritual discipline of praying giving offering and reading the Bible they are able to understand more abstract ideas like the Trinity atonement for sin the Holy Spirit at that age you can you can elaborate much more prophecies uh, old and new testament uh, you can provide a, a broad you sometimes you try to explain something and you have to say okay wait a moment and then you have to back up well this is this happened and then you can start to give them an overview of the bible uh, who is jesus uh, why did Jesus come why and how does Jesus love me what am I supposed to do with my life they are beginning to think about it spiritual messages they need to hear salvation always salvation you can accept Jesus um, 
God loves you, the love of God, the plan of God, the, the God always being with them, they can always trust God. These are things that you constantly repeat through your lesson, even though this is not the point that you're teaching. Often bring these. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more or less. Jesus is the way. We're saved by grace. And you can tell others about Jesus. So that was for the little children. I have one more. It's for the youth. We're not many people here teaching the youth. <laughs> There's only Ying and I. Uh, we're open to who else feels comfortable. They are more complex people, but I just love that age. <laughs> I like when they can think and they can... Yes. That means they are thinking. Yeah. Uh, I know that many of you can feel a bit um, challenged or intimidated, but all young people are great people. They are great kids. I think they have great parents. <laughs> um, okay. So, before you start, we'll just read something. Teens are on the exciting and sometimes challenging journey from childhood into adulthood. They are not adults yet. They are n not children anymore. It is during this important period of time that they begin to break away from their parents. They are becoming more independent, more individually functioning adults. They are exercising a little bit of independence. Sometimes this goes smoothly and sometimes it does not. But as one of the important person in their life during this period, you, you Ying, <laughs> at the moment, and I, and Melrose, and I hope other people, we will have the group, the Middlers. B, you will be with the Middlers. I don't know who else will be. Marie-Ange. They are in that age group. Uh, we, I think, their parents, of course, their teachers also, but spiritually, pa their parents, their Christian parents and us, we are very important people in their lives. We must know as much as possible about what they are going through uh, during this stage of their life. So you can interact with them with more helpful and meaning ways. So I have a list. Don't, don't be afraid. It's just two pages. <laughs> Sorry. So here are some important things going on in their lives during this time period. Learning that I am a person who is becoming an independent adult in society. So this thought, here it says, it's usually usually are terrified. Uh, I don't know. That's that training was saying this. Maybe some are easygoing and they don't think about it. But maybe some do, especially the 18 years old, because the, it's from 12 to 18. Uh, the change, especially. Uh, when they reach the end of the secondary, they are going to go to university soon. They are, I'm sure they think about that, the, sh the choice of, ca of career or studies, whatever. Uh, they are wondering if they will be accepted by their peers. This is very important for them. They are wondering if they will be all right on their own one day. More than anything, they want to be accepted and loved no matter what. And this is why it's very important that they have a, a group, at least at home and in church, where they are really accepted. Even though they say things and you say, my goodness, how can he be thinking like this? You don't, you don't show any of your concern, but just accept them, pray for them. Uh, because because it's important that they are accepted because 
many will do anything to be accepted. Some will do a lot of stupid things just to be accepted in school. Not all of them, thank God, but some. Because it's important for them to be accepted and some choose the wrong crowd. So love them, accept them as they are and pray for them. Uh, physical growth and development now includes moving towards sexual maturity. They have changes in their body. This summer we were with our grandchildren and do you know we have a, a teenager grandson now. He's 13 and his voice is changing. <laughs> and he looks like a teenager. So they are changing the hormones and, and some react. Uh, for some young people it will affect them more, others less. Some will continue to be very smooth, easygoing. Some can be extreme rebel, rebellious. Some can be extremely depressed because of the effect of the hormone. So they are not all the same, but generally speaking, this, this, what is happening in their body uh, it gives them all kinds of new feelings and sometimes confusion in their mind. Um, this is a time when they make their fate their own. It's, it's not, here it says, or possibly abandon it altogether. So hopefully not. Uh, that's why the teachers of the little children pray for them regularly so when they reach when they reach that age they will have a reason why am i believing uh, it's not their parents faith anymore they want to own their faith so they will have many questions and doubts some will doubt yeah but how can you know that this is true like i've heard a young uh, a young person say that but isn't it that Life is like a, a chocolate box, and all chocolate pieces is a different religion, and you can pick the piece you want. Something like this. You know, they have to have a reason why to believe. Don't be um, outraged when you hear this. Just answer the best you can and pray for these young people. They have question and doubt, and sometimes it's disturbing for the parents. And for us too, um, it says, if so, stay calm. <laughs> encourage questions. Don't shut them off. Just encourage them to ask questions. Rejoice with them that they are going through this process. Uh, reassure them that you are certain they will find their answer. Pray. Encourage them to pray uh, to find their answer because they really have to find it for themselves. If I'm a Christian, that's because I found Jesus for myself. And the same for you, and they, the same for them. They have to find Jesus. Um, be supportive of, it says, the child, I would say, of the young person during this process. Very supportive, encourage them. You're happy to see them when they come to the group and you wish oh hope to see you next week you have a good week be very encouraging application they ask uh, this age group ask what is true uh, they want to know if they can believe the things that you're teaching them they want to know if they can trust the Bible um, here it says whether or not they say anything of this out loud, even if they don't say it, they are thinking it. They want to know that God really cares for them. Now, teenage characteristic, they may consider themselves indestructible, but actually they can be very fr fragile. Uh, they may consider themselves or their friend to be right all of the time. Yeah, they know better than us. They really know better than us. Even though, be, because they don't realize we have experience, which is old-fashioned for them. Just bear with them and pray for them. 
Hugh says it, it's funny. They are often wrong, but they, never, they are never in doubt about it. <laughs> they engage in thoughtful discussion in moral issues, philosophical issues. They can talk. Not all of them, mind you. Some are more reserved, but yeah, they, you can make them talk. Um, they want to understand why people say one thing but do another. See, they have eyes. So live your Christian life because they are very uh, aware of right and wrong and justice and injustice. And so if you say something and or some people say they are Christian and they don't live it, for them it affects them. It can be even enough to make them turn their back, unfortunately. It says, often frustrated by this sort of behavior in friends, relatives, and society. Even if you're not teachers of the young people, be kind to them. Don't be afraid to talk to them and know them and talk to them and, and be their friend. Question teens need the answers to. How do I relate to God? What does that mean to my life? How am I supposed to live my life? If God's going to judge me, how do I want to live? What gets me saved? Um, our behavior, even our good behavior, is not what saves us. They need to know that. Why should I be good? Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my command. Things, things need to learn and do. Read their Bible talk about it often, read their Bible and the importance of reading. Um, read the Bible a lot, also as a class, read the verses. It's, our material has verses and sometimes they suggest more verses, so we open the Bible and sometimes you can add more. Um, spiritual truth, they need to hear. They are able to learn and understand profound truths about the Word of God. I'm, and I'm very surprised sometimes to hear some of them. We ask a question and many answers are very d deep and very true. We can realize they understand. Um, and thank you parents for teaching your you children and praying for them. It's not, it's not only us. The family is important. They have a keen sense of right and wrong, and they desire justice. They are real idealistic, and they are often disturbed when things don't work out right. They need to learn that God can be trusted at His word, that He loves them, cares for them, He has a plan for their lives. They can trust Him to always be there for them, no matter what. And he says what God's way is the best, sorry, God's way is the best. So, as difficult as this age can be, it is a very important age. Because if teens don't figure out these things, how they fit into the world and relate to God at this age, then they risk carrying all of their confusion and insecurities into their adulthood and risk becoming poorly functioning adults. So, it's, a cru it's crucial that you work hard with teens. It's more than just look at the book. We really need to pray and think. And many times I'm really angry at myself because after I finish my lesson, I say, ah, yes, I could have told them that. Oh, yes, I could have this and that. So start early. Going back to the little ones, teaching the little ones, or elementary, any age. All age are important, but the, the teens, it's, it's a tough time, but uh, I, I trust God that whoever has taken the step to teach them here, God will use you. So that's all for today from me. I'm sorry I, I bored you with all that, but I think it's important that you know that you've seen a progression from early childhood to teenage and how each of your 
work is, is, is important in their lives. When we get them at the older age, you have trained them before, you have taught them before. So I'm very pleased to work with our young people. Those who work with the little ones, I'm really, um, how should I say, admiring you. <laughs> because I, I don't know, to me, they are, would be a mountain, they would be a mountain for me. But God has chosen you where you are. Be diligent to do what you have to do. Do it well. If you want a handout, eventually I can, I can make a printout. Yes, you have, you've printed it? The one I sent you? Everything. How many copies? <laughs> okay. Because my second formatting was not as good as my first. You did it. God bless you, Melrose. So we will stop here because it's late. It's already four. Thank you for coming. Uh, next time we will learn a bit about discipline. But just briefly, we will learn, uh, learn about learning styles. You probably have heard about it. And we will have uh, an overview of the material going through it. And uh, in the meantime, God bless you.